Hello and welcome to The Arise interview, 60 glorious minutes of multifaceted discussion where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things and we feature the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next hour, two years after Nigeria emerged from recession, the country is still faced with a low growth rate, a far cry from better days less than a decade ago. As the central bank battles to reverse the economic slump, faced with the challenges of rising inflation, growing poverty and diversifying an oil-dependent economy, we speak exclusively to the governor of the central bank, Godwin Emefiele, as he defends his monetary policy, his core mandate and the instruments he's using to stimulate growth in a moment. Well, welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyakolu. Now, in a country where higher food prices have pushed up annual inflation to its highest level in 17 months, the country's borders have been closed in a crackdown on smuggling and growing government debt is causing concern. I sat down with the governor of Nigeria, Central Bank, Godwin Emefiele, in an exclusive interview with Arise News. Let's listen in. Thank you very much indeed for talking to Arise News. You've been variously described over a period of time as the unseen hand behind the Nigerian throne, the Nigerian economy, uh, a brilliant mover, somebody who is in charge of, in some ways, of the money market, moves it in different directions, the master dealer, as, as it were. Is this a man whose career you recognize as both a central banker and a former commercial banker yourself? Well, uh, Charles, and thank you very much for having me um, on Arise TV this morning. And, and I thank you for those um, nice compliments. Yes, you're very correct. Uh, before I came on board, I had spent 27 years in the banking industry. and. Um, and my career picked at a level when I was the chief executive of the Zenith Bank. And, um, and I'm here now for five years plus, and I believe we still have a lot of work to do. But the issue that you raised about um, whether you call it an unseen hand or um, somebody who is really uh, keen on getting things done, I thank you for those compliments. But I think it's not really about that. It's really about the fact that Nigeria has um, I, I pardon my use of the word, sort of receded when its contemporaries have made tremendous progress uh, in, their various, in their various countries and economies. And I thought that Nigeria, being the largest economy in Africa, largest populated country in Africa, that we can do it and that we should not miss an opportunity that we have at this time to be able to, to move this country forward. We have a leader. President Mohamed Ubari, who is totally, totally committed to the development of Nigeria. He is committed to the rediscovery of Nigeria. And I think he deserves all the support, particularly from people like Cause that he has, uh, he, has, he has great confidence in. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. What we're doing here is to say that Nigeria must make progress. Um, and that and I'm sure in the course of this interview, you will get to know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Well, thank you for... Um that answer which sort of sets the stall as it were because of course the core of all banking and particularly central banking um, is can the government and you're fairly operating with the government can they keep their promise to repay the debt keep their promise to preserve the value of the currency that is the core of the work of the central bank is it not Yes, um, you are correct. And asking me the question about whether the government is, is like saying, can the government keep its promise? Hmm. I'll say, uh, yes, the government can keep, can keep its promise, but everybody, government is not just about President Muhammad Buhari. President is about all of us, particularly those of us that God has put in this position to, to drive the economy, to drive the, econ the country, to provide direction for the growth and the rediscovery of this country. And I think we do have a lot of, role, a lot of work, work, work to do. Yeah, they will keep their promise by virtue of the fact that if you, if, if you I, I always like to remember Mr. President's uh, tripod policy. 
uh, reading the country of corruption, security, and economy. But for me, I'd like to look at it this way. I take security and economy. Security and economy, they go hand in hand. Our country, the level of insecurity in our country has risen because the economy has gone down. The level of insecurity in our country has risen because people in the past who had jobs lost jobs. The insecurity in our country had risen because industries that were once blossoming, industries that were once growing, employing people and increasing the productivity of the country have died. And there is a need for us to see to it that we resuscitate this. They are interrelated. If a man has a job, right? He goes out in the morning to work, comes back in the evening. He has no business getting involved in any crime. Call it Boko Haram, call it kidnapping, call it internet for anything. He is gainfully employed. If mm. he is gainfully employed, right, he, is being, he will be able to contribute not only to himself but also to his family and the economy, and so the level of insecurity will go down. If a, com if a company, right, um, that once used to be the, and, or I use the word textile industry, that used to be the largest employer of labor in Nigeria after the public sector. So you can easily say the textile industry used to be the largest employer of labor in Nigeria. If we could sit down, and allow that industry to die, right? A situation where, and I give you an example, you can imagine where somebody who is a security guard, yeah, in a textile industry, say, a textile company, say, in Kaduna or in Kano, in the 90s, right? As a result of dumping, right? As a result of smuggling of textile goods or cheaper, soft standard textile goods into Nigeria in 90, he lost his job. If this guy lost his job, he probably has four wives that he is married to, right? Maybe each of those wives, I mean, have four children for him. So you are saying because a security guard that works in a, that used to work in a factory in Kano or Kaduna lost his job, 25 months became, uh, he couldn't fit 25 months again, right? In 1990, by 2018, I can tell you that he would have had two generations. That is about 75 months, no more food for them. And you want 75 miles to stay without food, and they look at you and I wearing ties and suits, and you think they'll be happy with us, they will kidnap us. Mm. That is that's the basic thing. So there's a relationship between the economy, growing the economy, making sure that people have jobs, making sure that our industries remain alive, and the level of insecurity in our country. They are, if you lose, if, you're, if they lose their jobs, and they can't feed themselves, then there'll be insecurity. But if we give them jobs, the industries grow, the economy blows on, right? <laughs> growth, growth in the economy, the rate goes up, then insecurity will reduce. There is an inverse relationship. Right, but, but is it your responsibility to provide jobs for them? Because th there is a question I mark. You. It is everybody's responsibility. Right. God put you in a position, right? Whatever policy you put in place, there must be policy that must positively contribute to the lives of Yes, no, people, I understand that. But, but, but I'm jobs. wondering, because you've mentioned mm -hmm. President Buhari mm -hmm. quite a number of times, fairly mm -hmm. liberally, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether the continuous threat that has existed with central banks all over the world, we see it happening in America, we see it happening in the UK, in Brazil, and places like that, the continuous threat to the central bank's independence mm -hmm is a question here, ensuring that the government does not repudiate those promises that it, that it, it makes and that it honors those deals, otherwise its credit could be totally smashed. I'm just wondering where the line, you draw the line between that independence of the central bank and the things that you're talking about doing, which appears to be interwoven mm. intimately into what the government is also doing. No, uh, it is important, first of all, when you say interwoven what government is doing. The central bank is an entity within that also larger entity called mm. Nigeria. So when you talk about um, maybe interference by virtue of the fact that the central bank is putting in place policies that will help to engender growth, policies that will help to create jobs. There is, no, there, is no, um, there is no conflict in that. And indeed, it has nothing to do with the independence of the Central Bank of Nigeria. The independence of, independence of the Central Bank of Nigeria is enshrined mm. in the amended Central Bank of Nigeria Act of 2007. And nothing 
nothing is, is um, altering or in any way af uh, uh, affecting the independence of the Central Bank of Nigeria. You know, when I became the Central Bank of Nigeria governor in 2014, I released a five-year agenda program. And what I said, I said, listen, <clears throat> that yes, the Central Bank of Nigeria has a mandate for price and monetary stability, preserve the exchange rate of the country, uh, act as financial advisor to the government. But the monetary policy, which is one major arm of the economy, mm. um, must, must put in place policies that will directly impact the lives of our people. So when you say that your mandate as Central Bank of Nigeria is price and monetary stability. Yet yeah, it was the price and monetary stability that is conducive to growth, that is conducive to creating jobs, that is conducive to ensuring mm. that industries remain alive, whereas the primacy of your mandate, which is price and monetary stability, remains intact. Well, the reason, obviously, that question is asked, and, and the point you make is well taken, because obviously it would make sense not to be detached from the consequences of the policies that you put in place. In other words, you want to see them materialize. And, and in a country like Nigeria, you have to adapt to the realities of the situation. And I agree with you to that extent. But the, the concern is always that to ensure that the central bank does not operate beyond the selfish motivations and the political interests of the ruling party or the government in power, and rather has the common good in mind. I, and I, I, and I, I'm, I take you back again. Hmm. Whether um, you are a president, whether you are a central bank governor, you have been placed in a position by God to serve your people, to put in place policies that will enhance the life of your people. So if by that you feel um, the, maybe the central bank is moving out of its realm, I don't agree. But what, I, what is important is that we have a country, mm. we have an economy that must grow. We have a country, we have an economy that where its people must be seen to, be, to live well, basically well. And that is what we're doing, and it has nothing to do with any conflict or intervention. I'm wondering, if you f part of your fear is that politicians can't essentially be trusted not to devalue the currency by spending in the short term, which is why it must be taken out of the hands of politicians and handed to people at the central bank. Let me say this. The issue is that um, inflation is a canker worm that we must all fight. Do you understand? Because when you allow inflation to take over. Purchasing power will, will go down, will be totally eroded, and that will ultimately affect, uh, you understand, people's ability to live well in a mm. country. But to say whether it is politicians, politicians are actors or like individuals in the economy. And I can tell you this, that the primary mandate of Central Bank, or in this case, Central Bank of Nigeria, mm. is to put in place policies that will control in play inflation. Yes, absolutely. And that we will do. We are not going to we are not going to put the blame on the control of inflation on the politician or anybody. If he likes, because he's an actor, let him do what he needs he wants to do. But we will do what we need to do to make it impossible for him to take certain actions that will affect the level of prices in the country. That's our job. And we'll play it. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolo. Let's continue our exclusive chat with the governor of Nigeria, Central Bank Godwin Emefiele, as he defends his monetary and economic strategy in the face of growing accusations that the central bank is not independent but is simply a cooperating part of the current political establishment the things that you're mandated to deal with mm -hmm. one of them of course keeping inflation within check nigeria has hit its highest inflation rate in october in, months, uh -huh. in, in eight months 11.61 mm -hmm. um, percent mm -hmm. which is 0.3 percent higher than it was in september what is your reaction to that um <laughs> yes um the, the truth is this that I'd read a couple of reports that oh, some said, oh, inflation goes up on the back of border closure. And I just laughed. And I said, um, 
if inflation is up as a result of border closure, it means that as a result, because as a result of the border closure, right, supply of what I call certain basic, basic food items have gone down while demand either has risen or remains flat. We expect demand to go. So demand has outstripped, outstripped supply. And by that arrangement, you are facing what is called a demand pool inflation. And I'm saying, if, and I have to speak as a Nigerian, hmm. if prices of goods have gone up because we closed the border so that jobs can be created for our people, so that our industries can come back alive again, and inflation, inflation has got, prices have gone up. Some, I use, well, yes, uses the word 0.3% in one month, hmm. right? And, and that, for me, I am not, I'm not going to lose any sleep. All we need to do is for us to work hard to see to it that we boost supply so that prices can come down because supply would have gone up to people too much. So I don't have any apologies to people who feel border closure has resulted in price increases. The reason is this. It is creating jobs. A lot of people, is it rice? Is it tomatoes? Is it poultry? In fact, is it cars? Charles, before the border closures, I received a call from the president of the Rice Processors Association. He said, Governor, because the President Buhari said we should all go into production of rice for the good of our country so we can feed ourselves and conserve foreign exchange. You have, you have used through the banks, lent intervention funds to us who have expanded our factories. After expanding our factories, before border closures, most of them are, were carrying nothing less than 20,000 metric tons of milled rice, parboiled rice in their factories. They couldn't sell. After that, the president of Rice Farmers Association called said, Governor, you gave us Anchor Borough's program mm. loan. We may, it may be difficult for us to repay your Anchor Borough's program loan because we have paddy that cannot be sold because the millers are not buying paddy from us. Do something about it. Poultry farmers called us. They said they were carrying thousands of crates of eggs that could not be sold. Charles, eggs were being smuggled into this country. Tomatoes being smuggled into this country. What can this country produce if we could smuggle eggs into this country? We are smuggling chicken into this country. Chicken wings is what we are smuggling into this country. And all these were killing our own industries mm. and then making people lose their jobs. So what am I saying? You talked about inflation going up by 0.3% um, between September and October those prices will moderate. I am so damn certain that they will be moderated because efforts are being made to boost supply. And if that is done, I will use the word, take a bet, that these prices will come down. In fact, sometimes I, I even said, look, I, I granted an interview three weeks ago in Benin, and I was saying, keep the borders closed. Keep the borders closed, even for two years, or whatever you are doing to prevent smuggling and dumping do it for the next two years right so and see what will happen to boko haram see what will happen to kidnapping and see what will happen to people this country will blow up that is what we need right so so yes. you basically advise the government to shut the borders oh i did i'm not going to pretend about that in any case not me alone i understand even the security chiefs were in the security council meeting and they said that arms being smuggled into this country were all coming in through these borders. As a result of these arms coming in, it was also contributed to the fact that we said, no, shut the borders and let us see what happens. Right, and you talked about um, manufacturing, the manufacturing sector and how it's been hurt by smuggling and by things coming into the country. We've spoken to people like Don Lop, the Michelin, the people who used to produce um, things in this country. The, the, the biggest problem that they have is not the closure of the borders. That didn't even come up in the discussion. What was the their, biggest what, 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 issue was the supply of electricity in Nigeria. That's correct. number one. Number two was the ease of doing business, the, the, the taxes and the fact that people, they were getting hit from all sides. I mean, that affected their manufacturing base in effect and their I, will output. I will explain to you I will, ex I, will, I will explain that to you Charles listen we must give credit to the government government is doing everything possible to ease or make it easy for people to do the ease of being doing businesses is, is being taken on very seriously 
two, three years ago, we moved up 24 points. Just this year, or about, just about two weeks ago, we also read that we moved up again. The ease of business, doing business in this is, is moving up in Nigeria while doing well. Electricity, government is doing everything possible, right? To solve electricity problem. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, Charles. Let's even imagine electricity is a problem. Yeah? We're well, saying imagine. I said let's imagine. Right. I'm asking. Because it is a problem. Yes. Okay. It is a problem. Now, if it's a problem, what does it do to you? It makes your cost of your goods become more expensive. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. if, and then relative or compared to the imported alternatives, right? It becomes relatively more expensive. But you and I, particularly those of us in, poli in, po in position of policy, have a responsibility to say we provide jobs for our people and also grow our industries. So we have to put in place policies that will still keep those industries alive, notwithstanding the fact that as a result of lack of electricity and they have to use generator, mm. which I, I use the word regrettably, because government will still tackle the issue of electricity. But I'm also saying if that, if as a result of not having electricity, yeah, their cost of production goes high. Yeah, their ultimate final price of their goods or tires in this case goes high, right? We should keep those industries alive and also make sure they continue to employ people and people have jobs. And how do you do that? Compared to import alternative, you raise your tariffs, right? Raise import mm. duties, right? So as to keep local industries alive. And I've always said it, in Nigeria, we have raised duties several times. It has never worked. Why? because of the activities of our neighboring countries who dump and smuggle these items into our neighbors through their countries. So how will our own policies work? How would we create jobs for our people? How would we get our industries to work in Nigeria if we allow these countries to do this kind of thing, to undermine our economic policies? I am a Nigerian. I'm very sorry. I don't come from the Republic of Benin. I have a responsibility to make sure that Nigerians have jobs have a responsibility to make sure that Nigerian industries remain alive. That's why I'm here. Or that's have no business being here. Let me just take you up once again on that nettlesome issue of manufacturing. The reason I say that is that you've got manufacturers that are making an effort in Nigeria. You've got, i give you an example, Innocent. It's a car, man car manufacturer in this country. Um, I don't see the government driving innocent cars. I mean, I, I don't see the president of Nigeria driving a car that's made in Nigeria. I, I don't see them going across the whole of West Africa and Africa and pushing the idea of Nigerian cars being sold into those countries. Why is that? Well, uh, thank you very much again, Charles, for that. You are correct. And all I can see is that we will try as much as possible as Nigerians and, and, and somebody who has been placed in this position of policy to see to it that even we Nigerians, right, we use Nigerian made goods. Yeah, but it starts I'm from the top. I mean, you're not using Look at innocent my suit. Cars. Look well, at yeah, my but, but you're not oh, no, using okay. innocent it's cars. Okay. No, I, you I'm won't see the British government. You, right? you won't see the British government using a Nigerian you know car. And, and why, just, why are Nigerians I, using it? I just admitted to right. you. Right. Particularly I'm, the gov and government I'm telling officials. you as I'm sitting down, right, right? I'm, wearing a, I'm, wearing a, I'm wearing a suit. Let me use the word perhaps. They are imported. Perhaps they are made in Nigeria. But the point is that I'm wearing it. But the point is that we have to begin to say that we must use Nigerian things. Right. And, and you could see that even we at the Central Bank were making an effort. We held a meeting, right, another three weeks ago with the armed forces. Yeah? With the armed forces of Nigeria because we found out that their uniforms, they contract them to Nigerians who go to China to, to sew, not only get the textile from China, they get the textile and then they sew them and bring them. NYSE sews and brings NYSE uniforms from abroad. Mm. And we're saying no, that we should start by, by patronizing our own Nigerian garment companies, right? Those garment companies themselves will patronize Nigerian textile industries. And with that, we create jobs for the textile, we create jobs for the cotton farmers, we create jobs for the generous, we create jobs for the fashion designers, we create jobs for the garment industries. 
I guess that certainly, not guess, I, that will certainly create jobs and grow our industry. And I believe we don't have a choice but to go in those directions. And I, eventually, you know, um, they will in, in the next few weeks. By the time we come into, we, we, we started the cotton launching, cotton made in Nigeria now, we're already, we're already uh, harvesting them. We're going to ginning, into textile, and then into garment. And I'm sure in the course of time, you will see me, at least I will appear in a, in a function where I'll be wearing a holy need Nigerian textile fabric that will be so elegantly prepared by our textile designers and so that we can begin to really move in this direction. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria has powers to regulate other banks in the country and to create structural change in the economy. So why is most commercial bank lending going to the government and only a tiny amount actually reaching the real economy? Let's listen to more of our exclusive interview with the governor of Nigeria, Central Bank Godwin Emefiele. Let's talk about the other powers of the Central Bank which is to regulate other banks. What is your reaction to the concerns within the Nigerian economy? You've talked about spurring the economy. That appears to be a cardinal point of one of the things you want to achieve. What is your reaction to the fact that there are a lot of complaints that there simply isn't any credit available to businesses? The banks are not lending money. Charles, you know, <clears throat> if you said this, in fact, before June this year, I would agree with you. But today, given the policies that we have put in place, the kind of regulations and prudentials that are put in place for the banking industry, that statement, I will not agree with it. Before June, okay, there are different means through which the regulator can use, in this case, to get the actors, banking industry actors, uh, to catalyze the economy because they play a primary responsibility as intermediaries, taking money from surplus to deficit sectors so as to be able to help catalyze the economy because that is the primary role, role or responsibility that they have. So what the central bank had done, I used the word before June, is that you use moral, moral suasion, you tell them, listen, you guys are not lending, look, we need to create jobs and all that, or listen, um, you need to do something to grow your credit and the rest of them. We have used, we had done more assertion. It didn't work because we went into monetary policy committee in May and we're looking at the industry loans. Mm. And we found out that most of the times when we have analyzed the size of industry loans, they were at best, they had plateaued. At, in fact, in some cases, industry loans were dropping. Okay? And, and monetary policy said, Governor, Deputy Governor, you must do something because we want to see credit grow. Given that we had used moral suasion, all sorts of cajoling and all that in the past, and it didn't work, so we had to put in prudentials. In June, when we looked at the numbers, the industry loan deposit ratio was 57%. And we said the banks must lend. That since we have used moral suasion, it hadn't quite worked, we are going to get the banks to lend because we know what to do to get them to lend. And in this case, we had to use the prudentials. Using prudential men, we have to ins insist that they are decided that loan deposit ratio must be minimum 60% by September the 30th. 3% increase, which are translated almost to about 1. Point, about 1.6 trillion naira. Right? And we, we said they are, by September 30th, it had to be that if it is not, wherever we find any shortfall, we will take the money from you and, mm. and, and, and then lock it up in a zero interest, zero interest uh, asset where you're not going to make any money. By that, June, by June, 2019, industry loan was 15.4 trillion. By September 30th, when we looked at it, it had risen to 16.4. You could see the capital market is back alive again. You can see that people, are, banks are lending money. And we're trying to see, we all have shared responsibility to help to grow. And that is why we're seeing the banks will. Mm. So when you say people are not lending, that's not true. I just felt I should debunk that and to let you know what has been done uh, to grow industry credit. And you're absolutely convinced that the effect of these policies is having an impact on the real economy in Nigeria? It will, because and we are testing it on a daily basis. Uh, banking supervision department look at the numbers on a bank to bank basis and sometimes ask for details of where case, mm -hmm. in cases where the loans have gone up. And we are convinced, and because we believe that by doing this, consumer credit will be back alive again. 
mortgage credits will be back alive again, not just industry, not right. just corporate credit. But, but you have to agree that at this point, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and I'm, I'm talking about monetary policy and the effect it has on the real economy. Mm -hmm. At this point, most of bank lending mm -hmm. is going to the government. No, wait, see, what I'm trying to say is this. Right. That we have begun to see a shift, right? Right. From lending primary on treasury bills and OMU, we have begun to see a shift from that to private sector. Right. And that will time, I, I believe this, this normally has its own lag periods. And I want to believe that as we get into December, into the first quarter of next year, you would have seen that GDP will be positive. Right. Right? It will be in an upward trajectory because consumer demand, right, would have been stimulated, which would ultimately help to stimulate growth in the country. Right. But a, a lot of people would argue, though, that a lot of the policies they are seeing from you, the mm. central bank, mm. um, which is supposed to be doing things that has an impact on the financial system. Mm. Um, but instead, what we're seeing is the CBN trying to direct those things towards things that are socially good. Like? Well, so a lot of the, the stuff that you do to sort of helping, you know, poor farmers and, 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 and I mean, I, I know that that Charles, ultimately Charles, adds Charles, to Charles, the economy, Charles, I will interrupt you. But, but the impression Charles, that is Charles, Charles, given Charles, Charles. is that you're, you're doing things no, no. That, that support the government's attempt no. to simply do things that are welfareist no, no, in Nigeria. No, no, it's not welfareist. Let me tell you, you said it now, that the big issue, the big issue is access to credit, mm. right? And we're saying that every Nigerian who has a good idea to do a business should be entitled to be, it should be easy for him, as long as it's not a bad credit. Right. He should be entitled, he should be able to raise credit. And that by us doing our corporate program, where we are, we are directly through the banks and through our participating financial institutions, mm. where we are making um, um, and loans available to them, I use the word in kind, do you understand? And they can now go into their farming business and bring out the output that we are helping to positively impact the lives of our rural communities. And which I can tell you, the, 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 the Nigeria is not just in an urban, it's not, Nigeria is not all about our urban centers. Nigeria, I will put it conservatively, close to 65% of our population are in the rural areas. Hmm. And if you say you want to grow and positively impact the lives of your people, you must have at the back of your mind the population is about 65 to 70 percent of the population how to imp improve their lives and that is why you could see that some of our policies have been to improve their lives development of nigeria the growth of nigeria should not be centered around just the urban centers i live in an urban abuja lagos and all that but where we really do need a lot of attention is in the rural areas because by doing so we, when we improve the wealth economy of our rural population we improve the wealth of Nigeria because that's where the larger population relies. Now, part of the other big remit of the central bank is overseeing the government's debt management. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult and controversial a job is it, especially if you have a government, and many people would argue that you do have such a government now, that is liberal with its borrowing and its management of the political economy and economic policy. See, let me say this. Government has a responsibility to care for the people. The government is like a father in a house. The responsibility of that father is to fend for the family and the children. Right? Sometimes I wonder and I worry when people say, oh, the size of government borrowing is too large. Okay, good. If government does not borrow... Well, I would have imagined that you'd be the one worrying about no, no, the size no, no, of the I, government borrowing you, rather than someone I, else. Anyway, I do, I do, I, it's not about whether I worry or not. Right. I'm only trying to explain the issue of government debt is too large. And I must say this. Um, Nigeria is not a real country. By, by the way, our debt to GDP ratio, which today is about 19 to 20, 21 percent, is among the lowest you can find in any part yeah, of the world. Yeah, but people still judge it from the fact that a few years ago, Nigeria's debt was completely wiped out. Listen, the, the no, no country lives without debt. And yes, I, go back I understand to, And that. I go back to the story I was giving you, that a father 
He has a responsibility to fend for his children. Like Nigeria has a responsibility, or Nigerian president or government has a responsibility to fend for, for, for Nigerians. Right? It has to pay for the children to feed or to go to school. Two ways. Either he works and earns revenue. Isn't it? Earns a salary mm. to feed the children. If his salary is not enough, yeah, to take care of those children, pay their bills, education, feed them, clothe them, take care of the wives and all that, then he has to go to, maybe go to your neighbor or go to your bank to take, say, please lend me money because I'll pay tomorrow. That is basically what is happening. So, and then when people say government should not borrow, then mm. the only other option a government will have is to raise revenue. Yeah, but government but, says it raises revenue. People say, oh, we don't want to pay taxes. Okay, you don't want to pay taxes. You don't want government to raise revenue, yet you want government to build hospital. You want government to build your road. You want government to bring life I mean, infrastructure into your community. It can work. Government must do it out of the two. Raise revenue or take loans. But I'm telling you that this government is very mindful of the size of its debt. And I repeat, debt to GDP is low. But the big issue is revenue. Debt service is high because revenue is low. Yeah. Right? Debt service mm -hmm. to revenue is at its ultimate high. And that is why you and I should work together to say, look, what can we do to not only broaden mm. the, the revenue uh, bracket, but also even in some cases, raise revenue for people to be able, people must pay their taxes so that government can fend for everybody. Yeah, I, I think the main concern is that often you have governments that believe that the way to make the country prosper mm. is to borrow and spend, which is where your advice as an expert comes in, because a lot of the politicians on what don't have ex on what expertise in these areas. Government can either raise revenue and spend or borrow to spend. But where is government spending on? To what extent has that spending been impactful positively on the lives of the people? Well, Nigerians are still Nigeria wondering is. where it is being impactful. And, and, and the concern as well is that central banks are supposed to believe in things like sound currency, sound low debt with proper repayments and no defaults. I mean, There's nothing wrong with that. We believe in that and I yeah. believe that. Uh, we're working on that and where we need to provide advisors as financial advisors to the government, we are providing that advice. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, the governor of the Nigerian Central Bank, Godwin Emefiele, has been talking to me about a wide range of issues related to monetary policy and the Nigerian economy in an exclusive interview with Arise News. Let's listen in to some more of that chat. Do you think the government is doing too much in a country like Nigeria? The government can never do too much. Because, because the private enterprise, the private yes. sector is supposed to do a lot of these no. things. No, when you say this. Like create jobs no, and all that. Stuff. No, no, no. First, government has no business being in business. We've all learned that in mm. business schools. But what is government doing? It's not as if government is in business. Government providing infrastructure, providing road, right? Providing... Um, ho making sure that hospitals, that community hospitals are alive again is not too much of government responsibility. Yeah, but the but thing is, yeah. private sector really in some other countries have a lot of roles to play. Like for instance, yeah, building roads and tolling roads. And you could see government themselves had listened to the advice that they must toll roads. Give it to private sector and let it let and credible private sector, not just your friends, give it to credible private sector who will build the roads, who will toll the roads, collect the revenue, and run an enterprise that is there in the area of specialization. Well, w what I hear you saying are the things that ought to be done. What the I'm, government is doing something. Well, what I'm interested in is the things that are being done. Because you talk about ho local hospitals. Right. I mean, the hospitals are under-equipped. Mm -hmm. You talk about the roads. The roads are a disaster in Nigeria. I mean, let's not ameliorate the terms we use, the roads are a disaster if you drive on the roads in Nigeria. Electricity has not worked. And it's like, not worked. And relative to the past, and I don't want well, to, I it, don't it, want it, to it's, go it's, it's, too far to the past, relative to the past, electricity situation today is better than it was before. But why is it that Nigeria can't solve its electricity problem? Government after government mm. 
central bank after central bank yeah, has come in. No, that, and, <laughs> the central bank has well, its corresponsibility. Well, yeah. Well, saying, now you talk about corresponsibility we, we, when the, it comes to where it pinches. The government has been doing its best. That's what I'm telling you. That the situation of electricity today, in my view, right, the number of hours people enjoy electricity, again, I may be, it may be a subjective view, is more than it has been in the past, right? I know, and you can see it, our railways are working and government is spending money on railways. What central banks actually do day to day is mm. they lend money to banks, is that right? No, government, uh, central bank. Part of what they do day to day uh -huh. is they lend money to banks secured against the loans that the bank themselves have made, mm. or they buy the assets from the bank. Is that right? I really, I, you are not getting it right. Go, you're not a banker. <laughs> government, <laughs> well, obviously. Go, I'm not. Central That's banks. why I'm asking you right. the question. Central banks right. really are what we call lenders of last resort. Banks have a rule to collect right. money from savers and loan those monies to those who want to borrow from them. Right. But when central bank comes in as a regulator, managing, I mean, and, and they're monitoring the operation of the bank and as well as they're in the cost banker customer relationship right. to see to it that it is a cordial and business friend relationship. However, when there's an issue about the, that bank's ability to be able to meet its obligation, the central bank therefore steps in right. as lender of last resort. So does the, does the central bank then say, don't lend against such and such, and, and no, there you are know, regulations. do lend to no, other no, yeah, things? There are regulations, right. there are prudentials that talks talk about um, that you cannot lend money unsecured to a customer, do you understand, or an amount above a particular mm. threshold. However, that is a regulation that is also there in the Bank and Other Financial Institutions Act. But you should be sure that as a bank, if you do lend money, yeah, that is unsecured, make sure you lend money to a borrower that will pay. Yes. If that borrower pays, nobody quarrels with you. And that's that a big problem in decision. Nigeria, isn't it? Hold on, hold on. That would be your business decision mm. if that person borrows and pays. But if that person that you lent money to took that loan unsecured, and the person does not pay, the central bank will step in and say, we told you mm. not to lend money without collateral. Where is the collateral? If you don't have collateral, they will have a reason to believe that you colluded with that bank, mm. with that person, to, to defraud a depositor whose monies have been lent by you to a borrower. There's been concerns raised about the amount of money that banks charge for the use of cards, for example, when you use a card to pay for a transaction, that there's a considerable amount of money that is tacked onto that. In as much as I believe that banks are entitled to charge for services provided, we also do not believe at the Central Bank of Nigeria that those must be extortionist mm. in nature. Um, I will, we receive, and from time to time, we keep receiving uh, complaints about the certain excessive charges and the rest of them. And what we do is that we get our consumer protection department together with our banking supervision department to engage the banks and get those funds reversed back to those customers. If they were not legitimately charged, we'll continue to do that. But, um, but that banks um, do deserve to end some char charges or, for, or fees for services to, that they render. I mean, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot doubt that. What is your final message to the people of Nigeria? Those who doubt what the central bank's policies are as far as border closures are concerned, as far as getting inflation down is concerned, as far as getting infrastructure up in the country is concerned, as far as the independence of the central bank is concerned. What is your message to Nigeria? Let me say first, first, to assure everyone that the independence of the Central Bank of Nigeria has enshrined the CBN Act of 20, 2007 amended is intact and that we are working, but at the same time, we have a responsibility to work as a monetary policy arm of government to support growth and development of our country. And that we get that, yes, we are concerned about mm. the level of um, um, uh, 
joblessness and the, the slow growth in the mm. economy. Uh, the growth is fragile relative to population growth rate, and everything is possible. Everything is being done, and that's why you could see us doing uh, things sometimes out of the ordinary uh, to see to read that our policies must be those that will create jobs. Mm. Our policies must be those that will really ultimately result in the growth of the economy so as to make the country good for everybody. Now, on the border closure, I repeat, I am not saying that the border should remain closed in perpetuity. I want to repeat myself. But I'm also saying that we must engage and on very concrete terms and make sure that those engagements, the outcome of those engagements are implementation of policies that are, that are workable. Where, when we make economic policy in our country that should create jobs, that will get our industries back alive again, we should not and we must stand against the action of any neighboring country that undermines the efficacy of our own, monetary, of our own economic policies. And that's the governor of the Nigerian Central Bank, Godwin Emefiele, there, talking to me about a wide range of issues related to monetary policy and the Nigerian economy. And that exclusive interview will be repeated tonight at 23 hours Greenwich Mean Time, which is midnight Nigerian time, and also throughout the weekend at 11 hours GMT, 1600 hours GMT, and 23 hours Greenwich Mean Time here on Arise News. Well, that's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.